When you realize that Pharaoh that God went up against, that had his people enslaved, Pharaoh to the Egyptians is God on earth. He is God on earth. That's what Pharaoh is. And now all of a sudden you've got a man named Moses walking in there who can't even speak properly. His brother's got to handle the situation. And Aaron speaks for Moses and says, God says, let my people go. But Pharaoh is God on earth. And Pharaoh says, no, you don't understand. I am God. It's amazing how often the world will try to present itself as something greater than God is. We have our first Wednesday worship service coming up, not this Wednesday, but the following. And I'm expecting there to be some kind of a launch of God's presence through this time. I, I just really am prepared for that. Uh, real quick, just to say to you, um, remind you, we have two major events that are taking place or two major things we've started, we've launched here. And one is called Central STEM. Central STEM is our homeschool co-op here at Central Triad Church. Uh, the school had been coming here for four years, and then this past summer they asked us if we would take it over and if we would run with this. And we have 325 students this fall alone. Isn't that beautiful? 325 students this fall, and uh, very excited about that. As a matter of fact, we had orientation today. This is what orientation kind of looks like. Over 500 people in this room for orientation just to come and find out what they got to do. Yeah, give some praise to the Lord. That's good stuff, man. And this does not include the high school crowd that came on Tuesday the week before. And so there's a high school group. There's, this is for every age group. And I know that the spring semester, we start uh, registration for spring come October. And uh, if you're not on the website, not checking it out, it goes very, very, very fast. And so if you want to get your kids involved with this process, this homeschool process, it stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. They have multiple types of classes. I can't remember. I think it's like 40 teachers, I think, total that are involved with this. All these are educated uh, degree teachers that are here uh, giving of their time. It's really a beautiful thing that God's doing here and giving people an option for their kids uh, that are concerned about situations in the public school scenarios and what they're dealing with. So we're very excited about this, very proud of it, very thankful for it, and uh, looking forward to what God's doing there. So be ready for that. Also, Central GPS, fall semester is coming up soon. So now not only do we have, we have our own online college now, now we have our own in-house homeschool for, for, for uh, what is it? It starts, not, it doesn't start off at kindergarten. What start off at, baby? It starts off at uh, third, fourth grade, something like that. I forget the exact date. I'll give it to you. Great. So we're very excited. I, I think a church that's educated is a powerful church. Come on, somebody. And so we're very excited about that and uh, looking forward to what God's doing. Also, next Sunday, I'll be announcing our first ever scholarship to Central GPS. Looking forward to that as well. And I'll be telling you that next Sunday as well. So this big things are happening, and we're really excited about what God is doing. And I can't wait for you guys to all be a part of it and see it. Hasn't it been a wonderful atmosphere in the house this morning that we have felt so far? Man. Our praise team and this, and this wonderful band working so hard and everybody doing everything they have to do around this building. And it's good to have uh, Melvin Aikens back with us for a couple of weeks. Boy, we really enjoyed having him back home. Yeah. Good to have Melvin back. Love that guy. I want to speak today on, continue our series on I Was Made For This. If I say, I was made for this. I want to speak this morning about the culture, the culture of Central Triad Church, who we are. Let's go over this real quick and read it together. We've been talking about the last couple of weeks. What is our vision statement? Our vision statement is to transform lives. All right, we're getting there. That's great. What's our mission? We want people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, make a difference. We measure it by lost people saved, saved people pastored, pastored people trained, trained people mobilized. That may sound like a lot, but it's very, actually very simple and helps us understand what we're doing here at Central Triad Church. So when we say transform lives, we're saying, we're saying we want people to know God, to find freedom. That's lost people saved and saved people pastored. It's amazing how you can, you can come out of something, but you still got to get the something out of you. When the people of Israel came out of Egypt, they had to wander for 40 years in the desert to get the Egypt out of themselves. It's amazing how that works. And I was having a conversation yesterday with a young man about Egypt and pharaohs and the, and the pyramids and all this stuff. And we were having a great conversation. But when you realize that Pharaoh that God went up against, that had his people enslaved, Pharaoh to the Egyptians is God on earth. 
He is God on earth. That's what Pharaoh is. And now all of a sudden, you've got a man named Moses walking in there who can't even speak properly. His brother's got to handle the situation. And Aaron speaks for Moses and says, God says, let my people go. But Pharaoh is God on earth. And Pharaoh says, no, you don't understand. I am God. It's amazing how often the world will try to present itself as something greater than God is. And what does God do? He goes through a process of showing Pharaoh just how weak he really is through all the plagues and the process. But our God is bigger than every earthly God that would declare itself to be great. Somebody praise the Lord for that right now. I was talking with a friend of mine the other day who's actually been to Egypt. That's one of the places I want to go, one of my bucket list spots. I want to go, go to Egypt and explore some places there, Petra and some other areas. But, but uh, talking to him about that pyramid and about those pharaohs. And they actually have, the, I forget his name right now, the pharaoh in a carcophagus uh, there in one of the museums. That's the pharaoh that was battling with Moses. But they don't talk about him. They don't let everybody see him. As a matter of fact, when you open it, they let him, let, let my buddy look inside. When he looked inside, his skin had been turned to a, an ashen white type color. And they believe it's because of when he was drowned in the sea. And because he was such an embarrassment, they don't want to discuss him. But he's there and they know who he is. Let me tell you, the Bible is real. It is real. Somebody say, yes. yes. When we say, that was, a, that was a free sermon. Sorry about that. Um, when we say produce disciples, we're talking about people discovering their purpose and people being trained, pastor people being trained. When we say impact the world, we're saying we want to make a difference. Trained people mobilized. We want to help people know God. That's our biggest, that's our biggest journey in this church. I, I don't want people just to come know a service type or a understanding of how we do church. I want them to know who God is. Have a relationship with God. You can have a relationship with the people in the room. We need to have that. But it's bigger than that. We learn who God is and how we, how we can change our lives. So how do we do that? We create transformative worship experiences that both unchurched people and church people love and enjoy. We try to find ways of communicating throughout a service. Even when things kind of get all super intense and the Holy Ghost is moving, we try to, even in those times, explain to people who have no idea what's happening what this is. So they can become a part of it and not just be uh, watching it from a distance. It's important that people can connect. We want them to know this was before. And so that's why we do what we do. That's why we have people all around the building doing the things that they do. There's, I don't know how many volunteers this morning, how many Dream Team members, but it's a lot. Just to make sure 9 o'clock service works. It's absolutely powerful. People aren't just looking for information. They're looking for transformation. Can this information change their life? How do they activate it? How do they use it? So that's why we teach the way we do. We preach the way we do because we want people to know. That's why we have central groups. Central groups are a key way of taking information and making it transformative. The ability to do something greater. Surrounded by those around you that can help you grow, grow stronger, be greater. We had a uh, fantasy football league last night here at the church. And so uh, I plan on winning that. We'll see what happens. But uh, that, that's a small group to us. It's a, it's, a, it's a way of getting together and having relationships. Today after service, we have another day of training for small groups. If you want to start a small group, we would love for you to start a small group. It doesn't matter what it is. If you like going to the mall, start a mall start, uh, small group. If you like uh, eating pizza, start a pizza small group. We don't care. We want you to have people around you, right? That's how it's supposed to work. You're only by yourself by choice. Because the option is here to be connected. And everybody that walks in this room, we want them to get connected. Well, we, we like going to church. Well, you need to be in a small group too. Because this will change how you see things. It will help you. All the small groups are listed on our app right now. You can go pull those up right there under central groups. See them. All that's listed. Register for one right now. And that's available to you. But we also want people to start small groups. And we look forward to that. Uh, I'm looking forward to that a lot. I'd like for someone to start a small group with the new book we just wrote called The Kingdom Guide. Somebody can start a small group with that. Come back to the back, and we'll get you trained immediately after service and start that conversation. They're looking for transformation. We can't let people come to church looking for God and only find us. Hallelujah. There's got to be a moment. There's got to be a something where they feel the presence of God. There's got to be a move of His presence. Meeting the pastors, meeting people in the room, that's one thing. But that's not the pinnacle of the moment of living for God. 
I know we have a lot of star preachers out there these days. Everybody just pass out when he walks by. Oh, get all worked up about his Facebook numbers and his, her, her ability to speak to thousands of people at a time. It doesn't matter if you don't meet him. It doesn't matter. None of it matters. We can have relationships with it if we don't meet him. We want people to walk in this place. They can see us and they can meet us and you sitting on the pew all together. But the point is they've got to see God. They've got to meet him. They've got to find his presence. There's got to be a life-changing moment take place. That's why we do what we do in these services. How do we do it? Well, one thing through weekend services. Here's one way we always do it, and that's stay in the tree of life. Stay in the tree of life. First John says, this is the love of God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Life is only found in him. That's where life really exists. Outside of him is stresses, miseries, failures, issues, problems in him, you can have all of those and have life. That's how it works. God can bring you through all the worst of situations as long as you're in him. There was two trees in the garden. We only talk about one, but there was two trees that was there. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's interesting to me that, that Adam and Eve had an option if they wanted to. They could have taken of life and had they taken of life, they would still be immortal to this day. But instead, what does the enemy do? The enemy tries to convince them they can not only have eternal life, but they could become God. And in the process, they are then tempted and they take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which always leads to death. This concept, it's not that knowledge about good or evil is a problem. It's the what you're going to become in the process. Their reason for taking of the fruit was you could be like God. You could become God. You could know so much that you are on the same level as him. Isn't that, isn't that funny to hear that thought? We, we think that's a crazy, let me put it to you like this. How many of you ever met a young person who thinks they know everything? How many of you were ever a young person who thought you knew everything, right? And so when you were younger and you were talking to somebody older and you're saying stuff and they're going, they're going yeah, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm, that's right, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Because we know, we know the older people, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting close to that range. We know that they really don't know what they're talking about yet. And so we kind of go, okay, all right, we'll work with you. We'll try to help lead you a certain direction. We'll try to give you. And, but because, because they haven't had the experience. They don't even know as much as the 40-year-old or 50-year-old knows yet. Can you imagine believing you can know as much as God? That, that was the temptation. That was the thing that they were going after, this be like him, become him, be greater than him. The same thing that Lucifer fell for himself. Being in love with God's not a burden. It's living in the tree of life. He always offers us the tree of life to participate in, and when we get involved with it, it changes everything. Kingdom culture doesn't mean I go to church with other cultures. Here's what it means. We are a non-denominational, multi-generational, multicultural body of believers walking in kingdom culture together. So if anyone ever asks you, what's the culture of Central Triad Church like? Your answer is, it's the kingdom culture. Kingdom culture means we learn, we have learned, and are still learning how to be family in the name of Jesus Christ. We're learning how to weep with each other, and we're learning how to celebrate with each other. We're learning how to support each other and lift each other up. It's a process of learning how to live in kingdom. We're blessed in this place. I believe this house looks like what heaven's going to look like. And because we work to maintain that, we strive to keep relationships because we need them. Somebody say, yeah. We have learned and we're still learning. Our brothers and sisters in Christ, we all come from different cultures. But I want to be a part of your life. You want to be a part of mine. 
When I hurt, you're going to hurt. When I cry, you're going to cry. When I celebrate, you're going to celebrate. When you cry, I'm going to cry. When you hurt, I'm going to hurt. It's part of being a part of the family. The church is a massive family, a place where you can find help and healing. And we operate in the kingdom culture of God. Let's talk more about that. Let's get some more information about what is a kingdom culture. And I got a whole book on that called The Kingdom Guy, but we'll start for a little bit right here. It's fun to say it out loud. <laughs> I always hear other people say it. I got a book that, I got a book. Never mind. Um, Romans 14, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it is peace in the Holy Ghost. Give us a basic breakdown of what the kingdom culture looks like. Righteousness, peace, joy, and the Holy Ghost. This is powerful stuff because when you realize that this is the atmosphere that's supposed to exist when the body of Christ come together, if any other atmosphere shows up, then we have work to do to fix it. Because the atmosphere is supposed to be of righteousness and peace and joy. Kingdom culture consists of four basic principles. These principles are what guide us in how we lead this church and how we are trying to bring people into the kingdom of God. These four things. What's the first one? Righteousness. It means equal, innocent, holy, and in right standing. It doesn't mean I am perfect, you are perfect. It means we serve the one who is perfect, and by his blood we are made righteous. He calls us righteous. He calls us worthy. And we live humbly under that declaration. Amen? <clears throat> I have met righteous people in my lifetime that wanted you to know how righteous they were. <laughs> but that's not kingdom righteousness. That's filthy rags. That's pride on display. Hallelujah. I've seen it. I've witnessed it. I've watched it. I've seen it. I can't tell you how many hundreds of times I've come across people that really believe that every word they said, God said everything. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You got to be careful with that type of atmosphere. Because if you're not careful, you'll find yourself following after the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Trying to be like God. When there's only one like him. Him. <laughs> Instead, we are called to be in righteous, meaning equal to each other. Innocent in the sense of not guilty of our sins because he's washed us clean. Holy in his eyes. I, I, I came from a, years ago, I grew up in a certain denomination, and, and when I did, holiness was attributed to how I looked. And the more I tried to understand that, the more confused I became. Because I knew the person that was looking holy was doing some really bad stuff just yesterday. But today they look holy by man's standard, whatever that standard may be. And then there's some areas of life that we have to understand. In my flesh, I can never become holy enough for God. It's an impossibility. I can never, you can never, we can never. He is by his grace that he calls us holy. He puts that upon us. Only by walking in him humbly can we experience what that's like. Humbly. The second word, peace, means to be made one, to rest and to prosper. Peace is a powerful thing. Peace, I know some people, some people might equate peace to silence. I want some peace. Everybody shut up. Right? At the house, you're working on some issues, the kids won't be quiet. I need peace. Right? <laughs> Zip it. <laughs> but actually, it means to be made one. It means to rest. It means to prosper. Silence is great for a few moments. But then you start hearing your own thoughts too loudly. Mm. And I don't know about you, but I got lots of thoughts. I'm like, okay, someone say something quickly. Too quiet. Peace is a powerful thing. Resting in him is one of the most powerful things we can ever truly learn. Rest is a gift. 
Rest is not equated to laziness or not doing. Rest is talking about trust and living in him. I can rest in the fact that he has my situation in his hands. If I'm not resting in that, then what I'm doing is I'm trying to solve my situation with my own power. And in many ways, I'll just make it worse. Rest. Prosper. How many want to prosper? Oh, I know. If you don't want to prosper, that's an interesting thing. How many want to prosper? Yeah. Right. Nothing wrong with being prosperous in your life. Nothing wrong with that. I know Christians that are so afraid of hearing the word prosper or prosperity, they run from the church thinking you're going to preach a prosperity message. When the fact is, the Bible mentions us prospering many times. Wanting us to be able to do more. Not necessarily have more, but do more. When you can have more, sometimes you can do more. But I see people have very little, do an awful, awful lot. But to be able to prosper in Him is a powerful thing. He will bless, He will multiply, He will cause us to grow in, in, in incredible ways. When we learn how to rest in Him, we can also prosper. As a matter of fact, we had some people come to church, I don't know, a few months ago, uh, Brandy, they came in and, and, and actually while Pastor Nett was giving the moment for the offering, they were loving the church, loving, 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 and, and then when she gave the moment for the offering, they freaked out because they thought this was about us prospering, too much prosperity. It's amazing how easily people can get so confused about something because of whatever denomination or religion they got pounded into their head. We're not denominational. We're non-denominational for a reason. We're Bible-based. Amen? You know, there's many denominations out there today that not a single minister preaches a sermon that God gives them. They only preach whatever the top guy writes. And every pastor of that entire thing preaches that message. Hallelujah. Never mind. I'll move on. <laughs> Meanwhile, we, we work on our messages. Once y'all know we work, we rewrite these. The Lord writes them with us. All right, that's how this works. The Lord writes them. Joy means to be cheerful. It also means you can have a calm delight. Anybody ever had a calm delight? It's fun, calm delight. I don't do calm real well, but I do delight pretty good. It's a fun thing, calm delight. I've, been, I've had a calm delight all morning. I have, I have loved my wife's dress today. I have loved it. <laughs> She's had me chuckling all morning. I've nicknamed her Strawberry Shortcake. That's just me. I love it. Calm delight. Now I'm in trouble. I'm sorry. I'm now I've, I went from calm delight to sheer panic. <laughs> calm delight. Hey, joy is a powerful thing to have. It is. Isn't that right, joy? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to pick on all the pastor's wives today. Good job, joy. Way to go. That's right. Calm delight. Exceeding joy. And cheerfulness, a joyful, joyful salutation. When you have the joy of the Holy Ghost, sometimes you can't help yourself but have exceeding joy. You can't even help yourself but have that. It's a part of who he is. I, I don't know if I want to be around Christians that don't know what joy is. That's a miserable place to be. You mean you're supposed to have the peace of God and the joy of God, but you don't have any joy. I'm confused. I've never have enjoyed watching uh, Christians look as if they're mad at everybody all the time. That's a miserable place to be in. Go to a restaurant and, and, and you can watch them. They treat the waiters bad. You never get it right. It's joy. They're supposed to feel the joy of the Lord on you. The world should know you're different because they feel the joy of God on your life. Why are you so happy today? Because God is here and he's doing something great. All the time, right? Yeah. It's not supposed to be the other way around. So joy, that's what this house is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about joy. I like driving the golf cart. I enjoy driving the golf cart. It's joyful to me. I get a chance to hang out with people for a few moments and just find out how they're doing. Laugh a little. Have some fun. Why? Because it's joyful. It's fun. We should find ways to enjoy the joy of God. Now the Holy Ghost means led by the Spirit of God to really have life. 
you can't really experience life without the Holy Ghost. You want to experience life, receive the Holy Ghost. Now you talk about a life-changing experience. You will never be the same the rest of your life. It's funny, the other day, uh, dealing with the school, because now we've taken the school over. It's now a church uh, home school. It's a church home school. And, uh, you know, people kind of, every time you have any kind of change, some parents kind of get a little nervous, you know, because they're already nervous enough as it is that they have their kids here for the STEM. And, and somebody said, oh, well, do, 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 are they Pentecostal? And the, the lady said, well, you know, they don't, that's not on the end. They're non-denominational. And then another person walked up and said, well, do they speak in tongues? <laughs> and uh, so the teacher came, the, uh, the Katie came to me. She said, well, do y'all, do y'all talk in tongues? I said, when I need to. <laughs> But, uh, but we're not going to go talk to you in tongues. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a joyful thing, the Holy Ghost. It's a joyful thing. Sometimes I pray things I don't know what I'm praying, but I know the Holy Ghost is praying it through me. The Spirit of God's praying through me. It's my prayer language to Him. <laughs> Powerful things are happening. So don't be afraid of what God can do in your life. And don't just stop it because, you know, you didn't see someone else do it. No, no, no. Let God do what God was doing you. Everybody can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Everybody can. You'll never be the same, and yet you'll be just like the rest of us. You'll be those people talking in tongues. Hallelujah. It happens. The Bible says all the believers in the church will cast out devils, speak with new tongues. It's part of the process, right? Why is it so important? Because we want to be what Jesus was and is. We want to be him. What was he? Jesus, when he walked this earth, was authentic. He was who he was. There was no hidden agenda. He was there to do his Father's will. He was there to do kingdom work. Everybody was trying to figure out, what are you going to do with us? What are you going to do with our our government? People were thinking, he's coming here to overturn our government. And they're they're trying to put him into all these boxes he didn't belong in. No, his realm was much bigger than theirs. And they're trying to squeeze him into a box that they can make sense of, so they can have an understanding. This is who he is. When he said, you are healed, you were healed. There were no strings attached to it. The only thing that was ever attached to a healing that he would say would be this, go and sin no more. There wasn't some, you know, pray 47 prayers, get on your knees and crawl for four miles. No. One word, you're healed. That's who he is. He's authentic. He's authentic. He is also relevant. Some of the the greatest sermons in Scripture were literally stories, parables told that the people of that day could understand completely. Now, sometimes in our modern understanding, we struggle comprehending what that story was about. But to those people, they could fully understand what he was saying because he connected them to what they understood. The Word of God should not become so confusing that people don't understand what's going on. It is meant to be understood. The Bible is one of the greatest reads you'll ever have in your life. It has everything in it. It has laughter. It has joy. It has problems. It has issues. It has wars. It has, the, I mean, the list goes on. There's so much there. Is that you? <laughs> I thought I heard you. Help me, Lord Jesus. My wife said sex. Yes, it had sex in the Bible. You're right. It was there. She, brought, she dropped a little word on us right there. Isn't that funny? Yes, sex is in the Bible too. Some of the greatest love poems are in the Bible. There's all kind of stuff. It's a powerful thing. The word is everything. He was also, he is and was enjoyable. What? You mean you wanted to be around him? He was enjoyable. It's like hanging out with Newman. It's fun. Yeah, most of the time. It's fun. Enjoyable. You want to be that to other people. You want them to know who Jesus is in you. And when you come in their life, they want to feel the joy of the Lord and have a moment of peace and rest. If you're not enjoyable, people don't want to be around you. How many just love to find an angry person and hang out with them? Nobody. 
Oh, they're so mad. I can't wait to go sit next to them. No. Joy. Be enjoyable. Psalm, 120, uh, uh, Psalm uh, 120, 122 and 1 says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I was glad about it. It's exciting. Things are happening. Today at 11 o'clock we have Children, they start the beginning of service. We have a big bounce house party going on, back to school celebration. Next Sunday, we're going to have a big uh, prayer for all of our kids and pa families together and parents in here. It, when you come to this place, it, you can't wait to get here because you know it's going to be enjoyable. Something good is going to happen. Amen? I was driving home last night from the fantasy draft, and my wife tells me before the draft started, I've made dinner. Mm -mm. I know what that means. That means well, as I'm driving home, there is food already warm. And when I walk in the door, I'm going to smell it. <sighs> she made a pulled pork sandwich last night. Roasted this meat all day. It was delicious. I'm making up for what I said earlier. Y'all noticed that, right? Shouldn't have said that. But it was so good. Why well, I wanted to get home. Why? Because there was a meal there waiting on me. There was my family there waiting on me. Something was done in anticipation of me coming home. It's enjoyable. When you come to this place, I need you to understand, when you're driving here, there's somebody here cooking. We're working on something. We're preparing this place for when you walk in so that together we can have the presence and an encounter with the Holy One of Israel, the God Almighty. His name is Jesus Christ. That's why we do this. We want you to walk in this place and feel the joy of the Holy Ghost. Know that somebody's been preparing a moment. It matters. And Jesus was accepting. He accepted people. He never accepted sin, but he accepted people. There is a difference. I know the world gets that confused, but that, that's only meant to manipulate the church and Christians. I love every person, but I don't accept sin. That's not my job to promote sin. Hallelujah. Sin is what sin is. My job is to promote peace and joy. The adulterous woman in John, woman, where are your accusers? She was just caught in a very act of adultery. It's interesting to me that she was the only one brought before the, the, the priest, not the guy. Interesting, isn't it? Chicken. He ran off somewhere. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He was speaking directly to her sin. I'm not going to condemn you. She was supposed to die right there on the spot, stoned to death. But he said, I'm not going to condemn you. I love you. Now go sin no more. It's at this moment, now she has a choice to make. I can live my life in joy or I can go back to doing what I was doing before. That's where she was at. But he loves us so much that he would go through the process for us and die on a cross for us. He said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Why are people struggling so much this day and age with identity, with sexual issues? Why? They're looking for life, but they're looking for it in all the wrong places. Jesus was also powerful powerful. This is important. Signs and wonders are part of the New Testament church. What we do in this house, we pray for people. When we, when we believe that God's going to move, we are praying for miracles. Why? Because we know our God heals. We have seen miracles take place in this building. The kind of miracles that doctors really can't explain. We've watched it happen right here in this room. We've seen it take place. We have been a part of that. He is powerful. You do not serve a weak God that has no capacity to do miraculous things. You serve a mighty God. He does miraculous things. My mother-in-law was supposed to be 10 days in the hospital, another month or so in physical therapy over the stroke and fall that she had a few weeks ago. 
They were going to keep her for that long. Only after Sunday morning service, on Monday, after Sunday morning, I want to tell you guys, thank you for praying for us that Sunday morning. It was absolutely powerful. The next day they call and say, she's absolutely fine. She's coming home today. Nothing else needed. What an absolute victory. We go from 10 days in the hospital to and months of training, of physical therapy afterwards to she can come home in one day. Doesn't happen that way. But God is a powerful God. He does powerful things. When you ask him to move in your life, it's not a vain prayer. He hears every word you say. As a matter of fact, he knows the need before you pray it. When you pray it, you're just praying it so he hears your faith. Lord, I'm believing you're going to do this in my life. And by faith, I'm expecting something powerful to happen. Lord, I'm, I'm ready for it. I'm believing it. I'm stepping into it. I'm ready for it. And that's what your prayer does. Your prayer declares your faith of what he's doing. Mm. I think it's funny. I think it's... I, we serve such a powerful God, but I think some of our prayers are very weak. If I'm always praying for God to get me out of debt, why am I always in debt? Let's start with that problem. Did God put me in that place? No. Ha hallelujah. I did that. And I keep asking God to get me out of something that I created for myself. Now, he can't do it, but would he rather I learned what my problem is? And when I ask him to heal me of a sickness, deliver my family, when I pray, I've, I've gotten to where I pray, I pray the bigger prayers. The bigger prayers. You know, the prayers of salvation for people's souls. The prayers of deliverance in people's lives. Some of this other stuff, we can deal with that. We, we can... God, we can have moments of understanding and, and change some behaviors and deal with some issues right there. But when you, when you understand those things, then you can pray the bigger prayers. The ones that really matter in life. Salvation. Deliverance. Healing. Let's stand together. It's always an honor to stand on this platform and talk to you. Always an honor. We never take that lightly. We're always giving our best when we walk in this room, whether it be to run a lights board or to stand here and minister. But the most important thing is that you're in the room. If you're not in the room, I'm just talking to myself. I'm telling somebody today, there's a miracle waiting on you to happen. And God's got plans for it that are mighty and great. And he's looking for people he can trust that will trust him in the process. This next month of September, I'm really believing for some powerful moments to take place. As a matter of fact, a, a really cool mo moment may happen, I think it's on the 25th. The 25th of September is uh, Rosh Hashanah in Israel, which is the Feast of Trumpets, which is, and many of us believe, would be a time frame when the rapture would actually take place. We don't know specifically when, but we know because it's the only feast that no man knows of there in the hour it begins. It's a long story. I ain't got time to preach you that message right now. But it just so happens this year, on the 25th, it happens on Sunday morning at 1130. So I'm going to try to get us a live feed into Israel to hear the show far below at the moment of the Feast of Trumpets announcement. So we can be right in the middle of service and we'll just stop for a moment and say, Lord, one day we're going to hear that sound and you're going to call us home. And we're going to sell it. I'm telling you, it's going to be a powerful, power. y'all feel the Holy Ghost right now in the room? This is going to be a powerful time. This is not the time to get further from God. This is a time to get close to God. Close to God. Close to God. This is that time. I'm going to have the prayer team come to the front just a moment when we pray. And whatever you need prayer for in your life today, I want you to step out. Don't, don't ever withhold. We want to pray with you. You want to get baptized this morning in Jesus' name? We're ready. The water's ready. We got everything you need. Want we'll to commit your life to Christ today? We're ready to pray for you. You want to see the baptism of the Holy Spirit? We're ready to pray with you this morning. But I want us to realize who we serve.
today and how great he really is. And what we do here to reach the lost people of this city, of this triad, of this region, not for our benefit, because the king said, preach the gospel. And we preach the gospel. We preach it from a platform. We preach it with our lifestyle. Wherever we go, people know. Why? Because that's who we are. And they're going to feel the joy of the Holy Ghost in us. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you, Almighty God, for what you're doing in this house this morning. Lord, I praise you for the words you're releasing in this place. Lord, I magnify that, God, only you, you alone are God of all creation, God of heaven and earth, our foundation, our Father, our Savior, the lover of our soul. And, Lord, I'm asking in this place right now before we dismiss this service that, God, remind us how much you love us this morning. One more time, let's feel your presence, your spirit. Right now, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I come against depression. I come against weariness, anxiety. And by, this blood, and by the name of Jesus Christ, we cast it out of our minds, out of our bodies, out of our spirits right now. And, Lord, bind to us peace that passes all understanding, joy of the Holy Ghost in our life. Lord, be authentic in us right now. Lord, let us feel your presence, almighty God. In the name of Jesus Christ. We praise you, we magnify you, and we thank you in advance for what you're already going to do. We know you're doing it, God, and we're trusting you for it right now. Thank you for the revival about to break loose in this house. Thank you, God, for the revival going to break loose in in this region. That, God, your glory fall in such a powerful way. Right now, in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you receive that, somebody shout hallelujah and give a hand clap of praise right now. And welcome to Central Triad Church. Thank you so much for joining us today for this message. Feel free to take notes, put some comments in the comment section, and share us with a friend. We look forward to seeing what God's going to do in your life through this sermon and through this message. God bless you guys. We'll hope to see you soon.